Today I want to talk from the topic, Radically Joyous. And I'll be using as a text, Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses four through nine. And that text says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This week, I had the most incredible time preparing this sermon. As I was studying and writing, I listened to a variety of songs on my playlist. The Lord is blessing me right now by Thomas Whitfield. Think on these things by the LA Mass Choir. Marvelous by Walter Hawkins. But I also listen to Bootsilla, Bootsy Collins, or Baby I'm a Star by Prince. And even Dancing in the Streets by Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. The rest of the 29 songs on the playlist were a similar mix of gospel, dance, R&B, and funk music. And I had all 29 songs on shuffle. So right after We Are Not Ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ by Andre Crouch was Cherche La Femme by Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band. These are all songs that take me to a happy place. The text says rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice means to feel joy or experience of pleasure or delight. Joy feeds our soul. No, I, I don't have my head in the sand. I recognize there are many challenges facing us. The election that is only a few days away and those in power are trying to think of any way to block the vote or steal the election things like requiring a witness signature in South Carolina. The Supreme Court is about to become a stone block of conservatism. COVID-19 is still an issue and becoming more dangerous as kids go back to school, as the flu season comes upon us, and as people become more relaxed and more reckless about mask wearing and hand washing. The hurricanes keep coming, the fires are still burning. But in spite of it all, the sun came up this morning. And as we slept last night, our hearts continued to beat at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. And during that time, we took between 12 and 18 breaths. Most of us today can see, hear, and move this morning. We all had loved ones either under our roof or reachable by a phone call. There's so much for which to be grateful. We own our joy outright. No one holds the lease. The old folks used to say this joy I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Celebrating joy in the midst of the madness is a, ma a radical move. Our text for today comes out of Paul's letter to the Philippians. The letter is thought to have been written somewhere around the mid first century. Paul wrote the letter while he was in prison under an imperial charge, which would end in his death. So he was on death row. The letter was written for a few reasons. To thank the church for supporting him, to reassure the readers that he was all right, to let the community know how to live and to encourage them since they were undergoing persecution. Many members of the church were being persecuted for a few reasons. Number one, the people who personally opposed Paul 
persecuted them. Pagan outsiders persecuted them. And enemies of the cross of Christ. And those would be people who claim to be Christian, but not living according to the gospel. Sounds like some evangelicals of our day. Although Paul was in prison, he still cared for the churches that he started. Paul was in prison because he was radical. You know, lately the word radical has become a buzzword used to scare or manipulate conservative voters. The radical left is spoken of as if it was some ravenous vulture coming to devour the cities and the suburbs. But radical is not a bad thing, especially from a Christian perspective. Jesus was radical. Radical just means very different from the usual or the traditional. But often living with the usual or the traditional is somewhat like a fish swimming in a dirty tank. The fish can't tell the water is toxic until it's too late. The radical move is to change the water. I have to take a sidebar here. I don't usually preach from Paul's letters because there are texts in the Pauline letters that are used against black people and women and LGBTQ folks. But the Paul I'm speaking of today did not write most of those texts. The Paul who wrote the text for today is known as the radical Paul, the first Paul. Biblical scholars have determined that there was not one Paul who wrote the text attributed to him. There were three. The radical Paul wrote only Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st Thessalonians, Galatians, Philippians, and Philemon. The rest of the texts were attributed to that were attributed to Paul were actually written at different times by different people. One is the post-Paul, the other one's the pseudo-Paul, but they wrote under the name of Paul and they were not as radical as the first Paul. They were the ones who wrote about slaves and wrote about women. The radical Paul wrote about Jesus in a way that put Paul at odds with Rome. He stressed ideas of Jesus like Jesus being Son of God and Lord. But those titles were only to be used towards the emperor. Caesar Augustus was to be called divine, Son of God, God, Lord, liberator, redeemer, and savior of the world. The radical Paul attributed most of those titles to Jesus directly countering the imperial theology. He was trying to build up communities who lived by different values than the rest of the empire, despite the external pressures. And that's what makes this text for today so powerful. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Hearing this text in context feels too familiar because we're living in a time when there's much we can worry about. We can worry about things individually, we can worry about our communities, our nation, and our world. Like the Philippians, we're living under a blanket of pressure. But as someone once said, worry robs tomorrow of its sorrow. Worry never robs tomorrow of its so sorrow. Worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. In the face of everything that was pressing on the Philippians, Paul says, rejoice. Even though they were being persecuted and the le leadership was against them, still rejoice. They could rejoice because despite everything, the Lord was near. We can imagine that their trials caused quite a bit of eyes not to shut at night. You know how it is when the numbers on the alarm clock seem larger and brighter. So so much so that you wish you could just 
take your brain out and put it on the nightstand until the morning. Paul says, the radical move is to be gentle or peaceful and not to worry. He suggests prayer as a way to alleviate our worries. Prayer releases some of the pressure as we become aware that God is with us. It's important to note that Paul ends the passage with in Christ Jesus. That term referred to people who, in, who were in the community living as Jesus would live. People that would follow the politics of compassion. That would mean caring for the poor and standing up for justice. That's what it means to be in Christ Jesus. It was the radical way to live in the face of pseudo demagogue leadership and intimidating hatred. In Christ was a new kind of love-based community. Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan in their book, the first Paul reclaiming the radical visionary behind the church's conservative icon. They put it this way. Paul's message challenged the normalcy of civilization. Then and now, with an alternative vision of how life on earth can and should be. Radical Paul, we are convinced, was a faithful follower of the radical Jesus. Similarly, you and I can be the radicals of our time. Gary Hopkins stated, we have come to a point in time where using common sense, speaking factual truths, and asking honest questions have been deemed radical behavior, while in turn, manipulation, thoughtlessness, and dishonesty is often rewarded and rules the day. One of the definitions of radical is designed to remove the root of a disease or all diseased and potentially diseased tissue. That's our work, to do whatever we can to eradicate hate and evil, whether it be in a conversation, a town hall meeting, or in the voting booth. I'm not saying this radical love ethic is an easy way to live, and neither was Paul. It's easy to let confusion and anger and disappointment and even dissatisfaction confound our thinking. Hope is sometimes hard to hang on to, but we still control our own minds. We must guard our minds against propaganda by questioning the sources of the content we hear. I think it was the Buddha who said, what you think you become. We can follow the same direction that Paul wrote to the Philippians when he said, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. These virtues were not specifically Christian. Paul appropriated the list from the pagan world. The collection of virtues probably comes from popular moral philosophy. Paul may have been trying to show that Christianity was no different than the pagan world at its best. Sometimes people know right, but just don't do right. So it's up the, to those who follow the teachings of Jesus, those who follow the path of love and justice, to exhibit to others what it means to live a moral life. That was Radical Paul's mission in life and what he taught to the Philippians. He closed this part of his letter with these words, keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. It is the peace of God that enables us to be joyous. So I'm glad today that we can be radically joyous. We can make a difference. Not only will we live the love ethic of Jesus when the rest of the world lives by greed and power, we will speak truth to power. We will write. We will vote. We will show others what love and action looks like. And, and we will often and always 
find a way to rejoice. We can do things that bring us joy, like recognizing and being grateful for the good things in life. We're surrounded by good things, even in the madness. So go outside today, if it's not raining, and marvel at the beauty of the sunset. If it's raining, listen to the rhythms of the rain, or rejoice on the phone or in the arms of someone you love or put on some music and dance, just dance, whether somebody's watching or not. Celebrate joy. The work will wait for a little while. Thanks for listening. Join us next week at 10 a.m. Eastern Time via Zoom. Send me an email to drkathy100 at gmail.com. That's D-R-K-A-T-H-I 100 at gmail.com and I'll send you the information so you can join by Zoom. Well, have a great week.